It's time to ignite your soul and unlock your full potential. Join us on Beneath the Helmet, the podcast exploring firefighters' health and wellness. Hosted by retired fire chief Arjuna George, our podcast is the perfect place to start your journey towards becoming the best version of yourself. So come on, let's join the conversation and find out what sets your soul on fire. All right, welcome back, everyone. What an amazing year it's been. Today is January 1st, 2024. And I was just coming on here with my final episode of season one of Beneath the Helmet. And today I get to sit down and have a great conversation with Assistant Fire Chief Tom Marciano. So Tom and I will sit down and we'll chat about his organization, uh, the challenges that a volunteer organization puts on, the stress and well-being of its members, but also the good things that that we're doing to move forward in this process. Chief Marciano also shares his new program that he's offering called Six Tips for the New Fire Officer. So the link to that will be in the show notes. So be sure to check that out. See if that's a good fit for your organization. And make sure you check out the Firehouse Tribune and the great podcast that they offer. And as well as the, the just the nuggets of wisdom that they share on their show. I hope you enjoy this episode. And thank you all so much for participating in the Beneath the Helmet. Uh, amazing people we've had on here this year and i just want to thank all the listeners as well who have uh, liked and subscribed and are are watching and listening to this episode and this show on a regular basis i'm very excited about 2024 i'm very excited about what opportunities what new people i'm going to meet what stories i'm going to get to share with you all uh 2024 is bound to be an amazing season so sit back relax enjoy this episode kicking off 2024 on January 1st. All right. Until next time, stay well. All right, Chief. Welcome to the show. Really appreciate you joining. And it was a pleasure Thank to you. be on your show as well. So welcome to Beneath the Helmet. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Awesome. So tell the audience a little bit about who Tom is as the fire chief, assistant fire chief, and your journey from childhood till now and how you became who you are today. Tom Marciano. I am assistant fire chief at Chest of New York. We're about 45 minutes north of New York City, for people that haven't heard of us. We're located in Orange County, just like the choppers, I would always ask that. I've been in the fire service for 18 years, and I never had anyone in my house who was in the fire service. So the interesting part of how I got involved is my friend's dad was the fire chief back when we were younger. And he did his time, got out for a little bit, came back. The cool part about that is now that I'm assistant chief, he is now the chief again. So I get to kind of like work alongside with the guy, the reason why I'm really in the fire service. Oh, wow. That's cool. So yeah, that's kind of a story, but pretty much the same thing. As every little boy sees a fire truck go by, every little boy says I want to be a fireman at one point in time. And it just always stuck with me. Took a whole bunch of tests for career side, never really worked out pretty far on some and then for whatever political reasons here and there they sent nice letters but didn't work out which is fine because i am also a 9 dispatcher in our county here and i deal with answering calls and i pay i dispatch out ems police and fire so that still gets some involvement it's, it's a cool job until you're missing a fire and so if you're on police stats and you're missing it it's terrible if i'm dispatching it it's not as bad because you still feel like you're kind of like Right. involved somewhat but so that's pretty much me joined the technical rescue team up here so i did that about two years ago to be honest with you i never really had the ambition to join that team it just happened and i started utilizing it as a way of in my department i'm the assistant chief and tech rescue team i'm just kind of a glow guy so i'm faxed like more of the hands-on work type stuff. So it's cool. It's good. It's a good little way to separate things. Nice. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on what's more stressful, dispatch or fire operations? To me, a fire ground operation is a little more stressful. Sitting in the seat behind a desk to me is kind of like secondhand knowledge. It, I like to think it definitely makes me a better fire chief because I get this both sides of it and how it works and I know what dispatch is looking for and whatnot, but that's definitely a more stressful job because of the call taking aspect. Of it. 
everything's all fine and dandy until you have someone who's calling it their one-year-old isn't breathing or someone's like, hey, I want to kill myself. So that's where the stress part comes into it. I can imagine having no chance to really help them hands-on must add a whole different level of kind of stress for the job, right? Correct. It really does. And it's just like a, because no matter what you do sitting behind us at the end of the day, you're still behind the seat. Yeah, you can definitely help and stuff, but, and there's always the big things that says dispatchers are the first responders and I get it. Like I see where they're coming from at it, but as a dispatcher, like you're still limited to what you can do sitting behind the seat. Yeah, you can help. Yeah, you're that you could talk to that person, but some people still need to have someone physically there with them. And that's just not the case with the dispatcher. So you get some bad, you get some good. The worst part about it, I think, is that once you, you hang up the phone, you don't always necessarily know what happened. So it's almost did they make it? Did they not make it? The only thing that we have, if it remains in our county, they don't get better back out. We do answer the phones for medical examiners, so we'll know if they don't make it, but it doesn't always work that way. It's one of those jobs that kind of gets overlooked quite often. The dispatchers are such a key part of the whole process from calling 911 until the patient goes to the hospital, right? And even on a fire chief side, like I said, I get it from both sides here. So when I'm the fire chief and I'm doing my own operations there, it's always nice to see or hear a dispatcher that you know you can definitely trust because it's mm -hmm. like, all right, if I'm not thinking of something, he's going to, or she is going to think of it. And they're going to be able to say, hey, do you want this? I'm like, yeah, do that for me. So yep. there's always cool stuff like that. Totally. It's like a little angel sitting on your shoulder just watching out for you. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. So I'd be curious, in your 18 years of service, what's like, your, what draws you to the fire service today? There's so many different disciplines out there, so many different aspects of firefighting that we could dive into and be passionate about what's your passion within the fire service training training i think yes. yep yeah. and i remember what it was like when i joined when i was 16 years old yes. being a new guy yes. you're very excited and you're trying to learn everything about that so if i can give that back to another 16 or 17 year old that's joining our fire service and i can see that they have that passion like i get a kick out of that that's what kind of keeps me going because can you hear so many times, oh, the fire service is dead. It's tough to get volunteers. It's even tough to get career guys anymore. But when you see a group of young kids who are really into it and you can tell they look up to you as like a mentor, that's, in my opinion, that's something that gets rewarding. Totally. And it gives you back to, it makes it seem like that you're giving back to what the fire service gave. Yeah, giving back to the next generation. Yep. I've always had a huge drawing to training because that's, that's a lot of fun. Designing programs, designing training. Absolutely. Props. Yeah. That's the fun stuff for sure. It's so much even, and I look at training as such like a broad description of it too. Some people look at it and it's, yep, all right, you have to go do this, go pull homes, and that's training. But training can literally be meeting at eight o'clock in the morning at the coffee table upstairs on the truck floor and just talking about past incidents. Like that's training. Totally. Yeah. And yeah. I think people, if they would look at it more that way, that anything you do in the fire service is technically training. Like you and I sitting here discussing, this is technically a form of training. 100%. People are going to learn from it. You're trained. Yep. Yep. And then my thoughts always been, if you can be 1% better each day, you're on the right track. Absolutely. Yeah. So talking about training, I know you developed a pretty awesome program called the six tips for the new fire officer. What was your reasoning for starting that program? My reasoning was... When you become a fire officer, you're usually groomed. I was lucky enough in the my department that before I became the lieutenant, I had the current group of lieutenants, captains, chiefs that would groom me into who I am today. Tell me the wrongs and the rights, and what to do and how to do this paperwork, these fire alarms. But talking to other people within my area, I found out that there are Departments that are not like that. So there's people that get in, go, I'm a lieutenant now, and I wasn't taught a damn thing. So I thought to myself, it'd be cool that if I could create something that would maybe give them some guidelines to follow. Not that they're, not that I'm a professional by any way. And I actually spoke with a friend of mine who's a fireman in the next town over, and it's a career guy across the river. 
but wanted to expand on it to be like hands-on type stuff too, scene size up and such. So before we got to that point, like three of this, like, all right, let's let them get into the role right. first. And then this way, if they don't have anyone guiding them, maybe they can learn at least one thing from my presentation. They'll at least have some type of guidance to follow. And then my plan eventually is to hopefully build off of this with my friend, Billy, and make it in the South. Nice. So is it something you just offer internally within your organization or in your so, area or? Right uh, now, it, it hasn't really been offered at all, to be honest with you. I did it once on our podcast with the Firehouse Tribune. We had a 40 people turn out for that. It was all on Zoom, so that was pretty good. We do advertise it on there, so if guys want to use it for a drill night, because it's more of an hour and a half to two-hour type thing, so it's perfect for a drill night. However, for the first time, I am actually going to do it on a bigger stage. New England has a fire expo in Connecticut, and... I'm doing the presentation there. They gave me a uh, one of the time slots. So that'd be my first time ever doing anything like that. So yeah, awesome. kind of nerve wracking, but it hopefully, like I said, if one person can at least learn one thing from it, then I'm happy. Yeah. When's that uh, conference coming up? It's in October, like the end of October, I believe. Nice. So sometime it's at Foxwoods Casino Resort. So twist my arm anymore, but it's a beautiful yeah. resort. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'll do that. I always try to work on it and add some things. I just felt like it was something that you don't see too often. You see a lot of officer training once you're in as an officer, but you don't see anything to guide you into that direction. In your organization, is it promotion by seniority or is it promotion by application and it's uh, process? An election. Yep. It's an election process. An election. So we have three fire companies. The three chiefs oversee the three fire companies. And then each company has a cap and they could have up to three lieutenants. So right now, one of them has three lieutenants, the other two have two lieutenants, but they can each have three. You get voted into those positions by your individual company. So company one has nothing to do with who gets voted in as captain, it's company two or three. The only time the three companies get to vote as one is for the three chief positions. And there's a term, I assume, with those? Yep. So we all do from lieutenants up to chief. It is a, actually some of the line officer stuff is different, but they're all one year terms. It just depends how long you do that for. So I believe in my station company one, you can do it up to five years. So you do five one year terms for chief. You can only do three one year terms. So each year I have to run for an election and I can stay at second assistant chief for three years. But after my third year, I either have to move up or into a different position. I can't stay at second assistant. Interesting. So I know in your program, the six tips, I think the last tip number six talks a bit about burnout and stress. And that's as it's pretty a passionate subject for myself and study that and gone through burnout myself. So I'd love to dive into the tip number six. What's that all about? And what could you share with the audience today? So. My tip number six is after I get through all my fire operational stuff, admin stuff, and it's just a reminder that to take care of yourself. And that's why I make it at the end because it's a lot to take in. And after you're doing all this stuff, you just have to remember to sit back, relax, enjoy your time. And if you're not on your best A game, then you can't bring your best A game to anywhere. The role of a first responder is to help others. They always say strength, bravery, and the grit are all highly valued, I guess, characteristics, we can say. But you have to fight. If you keep doing that 24-7, you're eventually going to break yourself out. If you're not leaving anything for yourself, if you're not mm -hmm. taking time to just sit back, chill. And it's not just that you'll be tired from a burnout. It's you got to think about there are things that it affects. So if you're giving all your time to the fire service, and you have a wife and kids at home. Now that's getting rocky. So that's adding to stress in your life, which is just going to add to the burnout and everything just falls in, into place from there like dominoes. It's no, no secret. The fire service has a very high divorce rate and burnout. I think is a huge reason why, especially because I think people tend to get burnt out where actually don't get burnt out. And why do you think they're not knowing that? I think it's a 
lack of education and maybe not necessarily that no one's trying to educate, but people want to not listen themselves because at the end of the day, if I say, Hey, I'm burnt out, I need to take this off, take a week off or something like that. Firemen have to be big at macho. Everyone always smoke. Well, this guy can't handle a job anymore. And no one wants to have that start with. Well, you, that, but what you're saying is it is important to take that time for yourself. hundred percent. You're not going to be there for the crew, the brothers and sisters. Correct. Yeah. A hundred percent. Now, like we're human, obviously we're human. When you show up to a fire seat, though, know, the person in trouble wants a super. In order for you to be a super, you have to put yourself in the right, in the right mindset. And I believe it was you when you and I talked last week, you said something that instead of calling it mental health, it was like mental fitness or something, right? Yep. Mental fitness. Yeah. Yeah. Which kind of gives it a little bit more of a masculine name and mm-hmm. it's not wrong. And it's not just focusing on your mental health PTSD type stuff. It's focusing on your sleeping habits, your eating habits, 100%. all that good stuff. Okay. Yep. So what do you do chief to take care of yourself? So it's interesting because I am a, I'm a sports fan. So a lot of times it's nice to just go out, go catch a game or something like that. And unfortunately as a devil's Yankees and Cowboys fan, even that's stressful, (laughs) doesn't always make things better, but I go to the gym sometimes and that's always a help. It's the gym's a great way. It keeps you in shape for yourself, but it's an hour of your day that is just you. I talk to. We do a group setting in our gym and a lot of it is teachers and some other first responders, but they're not like in directly with my area. So it's cool to get outside perspectives, stuff like that. Some people want to read. A good book is always good to read. Mm. I think there's one called Burns Around the Edges that I heard is pretty oh. good. So mm, uh, okay. yeah. good I'll put <laughs> um, that in the show notes. Yeah, there you go. Quick vacations are nice. Nothing too crazy. If you can get away for even just a night or two, like it just give you a little bit of a reset. And then just time with your family. If you want to say, hey, I'm taking the night off tonight. We're just going to sit home and watch a movie. And if you have to figure something that you can do weekly or even monthly, like, hey, twice a month, we're going to make sure we have a family movie night and we're going to get pizza or whatever and watch whatever movie the kids want to watch. Something to that you and your, as a whole, and even your family can look forward to. I think that kind of, it helps. Especially if it's structured too. If it's scheduled every month, it's structured. That usually helps a lot of firefighters yep. keep on track, right? Correct. I do think it's important that if you are going to keep it structured like that, to make sure that the family knows that, hey, this could go south. Like I might get mandated at work. I might get something that I have to attend to. But if you're going to do that, make sure you're not canceling your night and kind of postpone it for something else. Nice. Let's make sure that we're not mm-hmm. pushing them off to the side, stuff like that. What would you say to a brand new recruit coming up on the department who doesn't want to turn their pager off? Like, <clears throat> do you, would you have a pager? Is that how you activate? Yeah, we have a pager. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So what they don't want to turn it off because they don't want to miss the action. But through my own experience, I've seen that being detrimental to new members where they want to go to every call. And sooner or later, they do burn themselves out. Correct. And they do. And it's easier said than done when you're younger because you can attend everything. A lot of the young guys in our firehouse, like they have girlfriends, but they don't have dedicated jobs yet. They don't have children. So they can, I don't give them the hard time of coming out to everything. It's the guys who are a little bit older where it's like, hey, we have a drill this week or we have two meetings and a drill. Dude. Of the three events we have this week, pick two of them and come to that. Right. Take one off, one night off. And even with fire calls, like you said, it's volunteer. So if you have to go out and go have some drinks or something like that, just say, hey, I'm not around tonight. Like, I'm not going to come around. The problem is that's always when a fire happens and they're all getting angry. It's a fire. It goes right back into the, I'm not turning my pager off ever again, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I tell people that you have to treat this just like you would your regular career job. Yeah. If you're taking a vacation, and I'm guilty of this too, but if you're taking a vacation from your job and you're just going to spend it all here all day, that's fine if that's what you want to do it. But at some point in time, make sure you take a week that you can take off away from here. And 
it'll definitely make you feel better until your first day back and then the stress is right there, I guess, but. <laughs> yep. Yep. Have you noticed a change in recruitment and retention in your organization due to burnout? Are people leaving earlier than they used to 10, 15, 20 years ago? I don't want to say it's due to burnout per se. I think it's definitely due to con time constriction though. A big issue that we see in our county, I think, is in even our state overall, is the training hours. So again, for a young kid, it's not hard for them to go do firefighter one for 120 hours or whatever it is, you know. But if you're 30 years old and you have a wife and a kid's a full-time job and you're just trying to get in the fire service, you have to go do this, it's going to put a toll on things because you got to come down three days a week and then on Saturdays you're at the academy all day long. So it's a lot. It's a lot to do. Some people make it work very well. It always helps if your family is very supportive of you. If you have a home run wife at home who's like, hey, I know these next four months are going to suck, but you're going to get through this. It's something you really want to do and I'm here to support you. That's great. Not everyone gets that lucky. The state has also started to introduce some hybrid learning. So 90% of the class is actually online, as it would be like a college course. Yep. And then you have to go to the academy. I think it's like four or five times I have that four month period that to do your hands on stuff for it and your final test. And so some of our young kids actually took that and they liked it. I haven't actually spoke to anyone who's a little older who's done it, but they keep doing it. So I'm guessing it still, it works. Nice. Yeah. It makes it a little bit easier for them to have that balance in life as well as the fire, because fire, yeah, some firefighters, fire is number one above their family and work. Right. Sometimes and it's three or four down the line. That's always an interesting topic too. And I know people who you know, fire service has definitely ruined marriages and whatnot, but everyone says, oh, you throw away your life for a volunteer organization. And I get it, but at the end of the day, like it is, it's like a, it's a second home and it's a passion. So when it's something that you're so passionate about doing, it's tough to sometimes give it up. So you just got to find the right way to, to adjust. Now, I know in our organization locally here, we consider it just like you said, a second job. It's not, you're not necessarily a volunteer and just come and go whenever you please. You're right. committed to a lot of things. There's time that you have to be there. There's times that you're optional to be there. But it's, it is like a part-time job for sure. And it's yeah, hundred like percent. I have I'm like a fire chief. Yeah, I'm a volunteer fire chief, but I still have to attend the budget meetings and commission. Is there some drill nights? I could take nights off here and there, but there are some nights that hey, I'm out of the house four nights this week because at the end of the day, it's volunteer, but I signed up for this portion of it, and mm -hmm. it's just something that comes with the the territory. It's good that burnout and stuff's not affecting you too much. What would you say to the fire world, how we can get better in our own mental exercise, our brain exercise, our fitness, our well-being, our character, so anything? I'd start off with learn about it. So before, if I'm going to teach about burnout, try to give a kind of prevent it, you should be learning about it first. I took a statistic here and... One of it actually says 37% of firefighters exhibit symptoms of PTSD and depression. However, they don't record it due to a fear of ruining their reputation and embarrassing their reputation. So that's a pretty big number. An even bigger number here is, doesn't say how many they, can, but of all the participants, 100% of them discuss the need for more education and culture-wide awareness regarding mental health issues. Several participants identified not knowing the signs and symptoms of mental health concerns and not knowing where to find the resources. So in my opinion, that falls on the agency itself, whether you have an EAP or whatever you have internally, it's up to the officers to make sure your guys are taken care of and they know where to look for that. I understand you can't lead a horse to water. So if you see someone not right, you can try to help out as best as you can, but you can only do so much. If people learn about it first, they get the education of what it is. And if they can realize it might not necessarily be a bad thing, you just need to take some time for yourself, it goes away. I would tell them to 
pretty much do just that. Don't be ashamed of it. And if you come down and you say to me, like, hey, chief, like, I got to take a few days. My mind's not right. But I'm cool with that. I'd rather you say that than your mind not being right. And you have a lot of reckless thoughts. And all of a sudden, we have a structure fire. You're the one in there. And who knows where your mind's going. Maybe you're going to go make this drastic rescue, which might work, but it might also put you in the victim's lives and in pretty serious trouble. Yeah. So a greater <clears throat> risk than's warranted, right? Correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had any members come to you with that statement or is it still that? I haven't. I think we've had guys who've been burnt out. I think we're all pretty good at just stepping away for a little bit. I lucked out at the beginning of the year because I was like kind of getting burnt out. I wasn't getting a lot of help with something says it was just a busy time of the year like where you're getting a lot of calls there's a lot of reports not get coming in i was doing different some podcasts work was busy and by some act of nature my chief's car took a crap and it was out of service took a month so i kind of used it as like a great opportunity to just be like hey you know what i'm gonna kind of take a step back i rode the fire truck some calls here and there, but it was nice to just relax. At the end of that time, we had a wedding that we had to go to for my friends down in Dominican Republic. Got out to that for four days, so that was nice. And then by the time I came back, the car was ready, and I was like, all right, I'm ready. Yep. Feeling right fresh. back in the swing of things, and here I am. Yeah. But I never really picked up on it. And I really don't think it was like a crazy burnout. Like I think it was just more of me just constantly being on the go. Yep. And my body finally just saying, hey, like, chill, you need to hang out for a little bit. So it worked out well. And I see with some people, like, all of a sudden you get someone who's around that will die, and then you don't see them for four or five days, and they're back again, and they were home. And you don't really ask it. They kind of just say, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm good. Let it go. And I trust a lot of my guys. If they ever have issues, we're pretty close knit down here. We don't really do much of anything without each other. Good, good. Yeah, like we go on vacation. Like everyone pretty much goes on vacation together. So it's cool to see that. Nice. So I don't think there's really anything at my firehouse that's too, hey, I'm not okay. And that they wouldn't stand up and talk about it. Yeah, yeah. that's a good culture to have for sure. Yeah, I think it, I think burnout gets confused sometimes by being tired, maybe a little stressed out, maybe a little overwhelmed, lots of projects on the go. But technically, you're not burnt out. Without doing those breaks, you will burn out. So that's the key. So that yeah, is part of your self care. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Like I said, it's just I don't care if it's a nightly thing. You take a night off to go to the game is definitely a form of a self care. So you're turning mm -hmm. off the rest of the fire world or work world or whatever you got to do. And it doesn't. It's not like we're on a firefighting podcast, but it's definitely for any job out there. Yeah, hundred percent. Mm -hmm. Whether you're in a fire service or you're on Wall Street, like it's definitely a thing. So tell us a little bit about your podcast world. You mentioned that a couple of times, and I was lucky enough to just be on your podcast last week. So Firehouse Tribune, is it, what's your focus on that platform? The Firehouse Tribune, we focus on a little bit of everything. On the blog itself, we have, we write monthly articles or try to, as I should say. Right now, it's Nick and I, and we just uh, brought in my friend Billy Lange that I mentioned earlier. He has written something for us, so we're going to try to get him on for different topics. There's operations, there's mental health, there's physical fitness, there's leadership. So we have different sections that we all write about fit into that aspect. During COVID, which is when I pretty much joined, we decided to do some online stuff and get presentations going. I had the third or fourth presentation on there, which was my six tip stuff. And like I said, I had 40 people on it. I had people say it was great. At that point in time, people were reaching out to Nick and I saying, Hey, maybe you guys should leave the presentation aspect of this and turn it more into a podcast. That's good feedback. So we decided to go down that route, talk to a few people about how to make it work right, programs and what to use and what to really discuss. Started off small with just Nick and I discussing topics. 
and facing around. We call it station talk as if you were just sitting in the firehouse hanging out. So we try to base each episode on a topic, but if we veer off that topic, it's not a big deal because we just like to talk about just as if you were hanging out at the firehouse. So after a few episodes of just him and I, someone reached out to us and they wanted to be on it. So we had them on it and it worked out well. And then we decided, you know what, why don't we try to keep doing that? He does a lot of the behind the scenes stuff for the website and social media and stuff. So I told him I will take care of the podcast aspect of it and do the invites and whatnot. So pretty much I sit, I scroll through Instagram and if I see someone who I feel like is putting some good stuff out there, I'll shoot a message. I'll reach out. Some people answer right away. Some people don't, but which is fine too, but it's just more of spreading the word. And a lot of people we reach out have their own podcasts, which I think is interesting because some people look at us and they're like, you just not kind of like advertising a podcast and taking listeners away from real. And I'm like, I don't see it that way. I see it as we're all on the same team, all trying to get our points across and that's how it works out. So that's, I like it. I think it's cool. The amount of connections I've made just like over the last year have been insane. Um, uh, yeah, like, same boat. yeah, after the first 16 years of my fire service, I'm stuck with guys who are like in the New York area, New Jersey area, which is fine. No issue with that. They're all great guys. Now talking to guys from you're from Vancouver or out that way, had guys from North Carolina on there once. So it's like all over the country and you get different aspects. And I think that's what also fuels my fire for the fire service still is it falls under training but now i'm getting different aspects of it. i'm like yeah we do it like this up here in new york and they're like oh we call i saw him from georgia or whatever it was oh we call an ambulance to rescue what what are we talking about <laughs> and so it's cool to see funny stuff like that and yeah. how things are different but it really builds a culture and it's good to see that when I start to look around my area and I see that things are kind of dying out a little bit, that there are still people around who are all about firefighting. Okay. To love the jobs. Yeah. yeah. It's funny when you look at the fire service worldwide, there's so many similarities. doesn't matter okay. where you are. Sure. Yeah. You might uncover some culture here and there, but it's all the same underneath brothers and sisters across the world. So that's yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I love it. The podcast will do one of the greatest things that we've ever that we did for the Firehouse Tribune not to be able to as our blogs, we don't really necessarily keep to just Nick, Billy and I. If someone wants to say, hey, I have something great I want to write, submit it to us. We might put it on the website. We have a guy up in Maine who, uh, Brian Johnson, does Mediac Fire Training. And sometimes he'll write some articles for his stuff and it'll get put on our site too because they're, they're just good information and stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think at the end of the day, the whole purpose of the Firehouse Tribune is like a back in the day tribune of a newspaper just to get information out there. You don't really care what it's about, who it's coming from. If it's pertaining to the fire service or bird services, like we want to get it out. There. Nice. Yep. It's interesting for myself being retired now from the fire service operationally. It's being, like you said, the connections I've made. So I'm outside the fire service now, technically, and I'm making more connections in the fire service than I did as the fire chief. Yeah. Which is not. ironic. Yeah. You know. Got how can us. people learn more about you and how can they connect with you and where can they find your podcast? And The first spot to definitely check would be the Firehouse Tribune webpage, which is firehousetribune.com. And then I'm on Instagram and Twitter. My Instagram is firemantom193. My Twitter is at marcianotom. And then on the Firehouse Tribune website, you can find the links for Station Talk podcast. We have on all platforms on a podcast, Apple, all those, Spotify, anything you name, they're pretty much on all of them. And then we can also do it on YouTube. So we do video them also. And the Firehouse Tribune page is on Instagram and Twitter, FH Tribune. And it's on LinkedIn at the Firehouse Tribune. And I do not have Facebook. So I'm pretty sure it is on Facebook though. I think Nick runs that also. So you can find all that on there, but definitely reach out to me. And uh, if you want to be a guest on the Tribune, if you think you have something special you want to do, you can email me at fhtribunepodcast at gmail.com. 
So that's always fun. And pretty much that's it. I'm always open to talk shop with anyone, I'm, especially if I'm at work. I'm not a one. There's I catch a slow shift or something, but I'm happy to talk to you. Very cool. Is there a guest out there that you're dying to get on board? Not necessarily a person, but a topic. Not really. I think I'd love some more leadership roles or even I often think about if there's a fire chief out there that has run one of these large incidents that we always see all over the news, and like the Charleston Nine situation. Unfortunately, it was a sad situation, but if there's mm -hmm. someone there that ran an incident similar to that, that people will know about. Like, it'd be great to talk to them about it, see where they're at. And I think of that because I was at Firehouse Expo one year and I don't ex remember the exact incident it was, but it was a San Francisco fire and they lost someone, I believe. And the fire chief who was in command for that gave the class and it was a great class. And that always stuck in the back of my head. Wow. Here's a guy that things didn't go right for him. He's up here talking about it. He has the he's not too proud of himself that he's oh, like, doing it wrong. He has no trouble standing there saying, Yeah, I messed up. I did this wrong. So Which I think that's naturally cool. drawn to you, right? As a leader. Hundred percent. A hundred percent. I have a friend who's actually in our department. He's an FDY chief. So I want to have him on one day just to talk about like anything because people are listening to him just know who he is. Yeah. But I don't, we don't care if you're a big time or a small time guy, you have something knowledgeable for the fire service, bring it on. Very cool. We'll try to get you in there. Nice. I'm dying to know who the picture is behind you there. Oh, so. <laughs> There's gotta be a story. Is, yeah. Oh, well, there definitely is. That is my friend, Travis from Fur River in Rocky County. His cousin is the captain here in this fire department, hmm. in my department. And at some point in time. They made these cardboard cutouts and little stickers of Travis and they call it, where's Travis? There's an Instagram page for it. Oh, nice. And anyone who has these stickers, they bring them over the world and they just stick them places. So there was one a few weeks ago, like someone was in Ireland and that sticker is like this big and it's on a street oh. sign in Ireland. Like, no way. Well, that's funny. Yep. And they just tag it. Where's Travis? So I got this one. It's in my wall and I tagged it. It's on the Instagram page. So funny. What yeah, did he do so, to deserve that? You know what? I don't really know. But if you ever met Travis, you'd probably be like, all right. You got it. I you got it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. So that's that. Awesome. Chief, it's been an honor. Stay safe out there. I appreciate you sharing your little tidbits of uh, burnout number six there of your kind of strategy yeah, absolutely. tips for yeah. new officers. So I appreciate it. Anyone's that. interested in the full thing, I can do it via Zoom. I can do it. Well, I'm sure in my area for a drill night or something. Awesome. Happy to help. Is it something that's on demand or it's a live event? It would be a live event. It's a live event. I can probably figure out if someone wanted it on demand, I could probably mm -hmm. do that. But maybe that'd be something to think about them the road, actually. Yeah, but right. it's definitely more of geared towards a live type of thing. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> All right, Chief. It's been an honor and uh, stay well. Thank you, Chief. Thanks, Appreciate everyone. it. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to Beneath the Helmet. We hope that this podcast has provided you with valuable insights into the world of firefighters' health and wellness. Remember, caring for your physical, mental, and spiritual well-being is crucial to achieving optimal performance. Join us next time on Beneath the Helmet for more inspiring conversations. Until then, stay well.